everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Top Ten Show. I am John Roca. Uh, I am Matt Nost, and uh, we are excited to be here for another week of the Top Ten Show. Uh, covering Forrest Whitaker this week, and I was yeah. trying to look up to see what we base this on, and I cannot find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on his IMDb and he has nothing coming. We picked something and he was like fourth guy in it. Is it a yeah. re-release? Uh, it might have been a re-release. Uh uh good to good to did you were you looking on IMDb like uh when we were having this discussion? Is that correct? Upcoming movies and somehow hey, what about this? I don't fucking remember who well, e either way. We picked it. We picked it. We picked it in why not? Yeah. Fort Whitaker's great. Yep. Uh, looking forward to talk about a few movies that more than likely we haven't talked about all that much. Probably. I would agree with you on that. Uh, interesting career, Forrest Whitaker. Certainly, um, you, you know, we, we first see him, uh, if you're of a certain age, you first see him in Fast Times at Ridgemont High as this like out of control linebacker after uh, he's been set up uh, by uh, some of the guys at the school and his brother. Uh, they've taken out the his car, Forrest Whitaker's car, on a joyride, gotten into some issues. So they mess the car up and make it look as if the rival team they're playing in high school messed the car up, which turns him into a banshee out there on that football field uh, in Fast Time at my High. And then seeing him appear in these like kind of smaller parts and then eventually leading to a great Oscar win for Last King of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And still doing his thing. A lot of people liked him in Jingle Jangle, Godfather of Harlem. So a guy who's been able to do it for numerous decades in this business, both as a director and an actor in great movies and in crap movies, Matt, he survives. People love Forrest Whitaker, man. Yeah, he's a great actor. Mm -hmm. um, I was just taken aback because you started talking about movies that may or may not be coming up on the list. And I was like, <laughs> oh, this is a new, this is a new thing. Sit back and watch. I don't know. Uh, just throwing stuff out there. Yeah, sure. I at this point, like, <laughs> I don't know what we talk about in our kibitzing up top. Yeah, we never it's plan kind of it. The, what's that? We never plan it. It's always just kind of come no, up. No, no, no. Up but comes up. I'm not really experiencing new things except through my laptop. So it's been the same thing for a year now. So it's like <laughs> hard to come up with. Oh yeah, the other day I went to. Yeah. Yeah. It, no. Although I do feel that now when I go out on the roads because a portion of People have been sitting at home so much. The roads have gotten weirder. Yeah, right. People doing just more assholey things. We're like, why are you yeah. uh, coming back? Uh, let's see, heading east on Santa Monica, right past mm -hmm. the 101. Um, yeah. Somebody was waiting to make a left a turn. So it's for those listening. There are two lanes on each side, plus they each have their own dedicated turn lane. Mm -hmm. And so. Turn lane has like three, four cars in it. And then the left, the lane next to that, somebody stopped at the very front and is waiting for those four cars to go. But yeah. they don't have a green to go. They're waiting on traffic. So they've blocked one entire through line because they're just waiting of, well, I wait on these four cars. And it's just the line went 15, 20 cars behind her. I was in the other lane. I zoomed right past, you know, in the lane yeah. that can make rights on other streets and shit. And right. you get to the front and it's just this woman waiting patiently as people are honking at her, not giving a fuck. <laughs> you're like, oh, dude, you're, you're being a jerk right now. Your time is not valuable, more valuable than the 20 people behind you. So just go to the next light, make a left and backtrack instead of being a jerk. <laughs> there's, there's one every 10th of a mile in this section of the city and you fucking yeah. know it. Yeah. That's true. Uh, it's very true, yeah, my man. <laughs> it is. I've seen a lot of that lately, or dashers double parking behind you if you have yeah. to go somewhere. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Most of them are really cool about it. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And but I have gotten one guy who's like, oh, I'm like, I'm I'm sorry. I should call you get you towed right now. Fuck off. You know you're in the wrong. I realize we're you? in a pandemic, oh. so I would never yeah, but we're you're in the wrong and you know it. <laughs> uh, oh, that's funny. the people are like my bad i'm completely forgiving of, of it course. Like, no problem dude we've yeah, all no been problem. there we all been yeah, there. yeah. and yeah, plus yeah. you are literally trying to go there grab it and get out yes so yeah, absolutely. i thoroughly understand if there's no parking if you want to get in get there's one place in particular i'm thinking of uh but if you're being a dick to be a dick i saw a guy who was driving uh back over anyway another situation like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit quicker area it goes over this uh, bridge but it's from glendale into silver lake yeah and 
a dude in F-150, like a, a late 80s F-150, was driving dead center on both lanes trying to figure out who was going faster and did Holy that shit. for, yeah, like two tenths of a mile. And just wow. right on both of, it was the car behind me and the car next to its asses. And I was like, mm. Jesus, guy. I think uh, people are just fucking antsy, man. They're antsy to get out of the house. Yeah. They're antsy to be out on the road. They haven't been driving consistently because of all the situation with COVID. And then when they get out there, you know, they just kind of are freaking out. I know for me personally, I've had moments where I've gotten in the car and it feels like I'm not, I feels otherworldly. It feels like I'm outside my body experiencing myself driving the car. It's weird because you're not used to the overstimulation. Uh, and especially where I'm at now, people are mm -hmm. going out more and more over the last few weeks because of the vaccine. People feel more comfortable. There hasn't been a large amount of people getting infected here in a certain town that I live in. Uh, and so people feel more free to go do everything. So sure. occasionally I have to go run an errand or go get something and everything's five to 10 minutes away, man. It's great. But I'll get into those big parking lots and you just kind of freak the fuck out because people are just randomly walking, people are backing out. People, do, I'm just like, ah, you know? And so sometimes I'll pull and park at the farthest parking spot so I don't have to deal with any of that nonsense and then roll on out of there. But yeah, I have been in those moments where I'm probably the idiot in the car who people are watching me drive from behind me going, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Because I can't figure out, you know, I can't recalibrate myself. It sounds like you got to stay off the roads, man. <laughs> That's why it sounds like some of the people I'm running into out there that uh, look a little jittery behind the wheel. Not going to lie. Not going to lie. But then, Today, I had my first road rage, like, yell at somebody, and it felt kind of nice to feel that way again. It's been a year since I've really had that. Yeah, but at the same time, <laughs> I would have to assume this is not an indictment of you, but given the yeah. fact that you just laid the groundwork for your skittish behind the wheel and all that, it sounds like it might have been your fault. They were honking <laughs> at you, and you went, fuck, fuck me, fuck you. <laughs> uh, you it I'm didn't sound like before you were doing that well. I'm saying I'm occasionally jittery. I'm normally fine, but every once in a while. But today oh, all, I was cool. Yeah. Yeah, we all get it. Yeah. Just this oh, person yeah, what was I driving do. so fucking slow. And they were driving by a a, a, a a playground area and they were driving yeah. really slow by the playground area. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? I know. Move. Move. Yeah. I saw a lady the other day. So uh a woman and her two kids in front of their house. Yeah. And it was like one of those streets where technically it's got Cars parked on both sides. Technically, two cars can get through. You know what I mean? So traffic yeah. can, but not really. Right. Like, kind of near your old place. Oh, okay. Okay. But yeah, a little area. bit wider. So right. it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we both go slow enough, we can pass. Mm -hmm. Um, And she had cranked her car oh, at a 45-degree angle and had her window down talking to the mom because they had kids. And you're like, dude, you are blocking potentially two lanes of traffic to shoot the shit right now. But everybody's just been like, so nice to be out. That's not what it giving is. a fuck. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, people think they live in small towns. Uh, and they can just do whatever they want. My favorite are people uh, that double, double park in that to like get out in those oh, neighborhoods yeah. when there's a spot five oh, yeah. feet away. It's oh, like, yeah. dude, just take the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but this has been old man parking complaints for <laughs> five minutes. I could do this all day, baby. I, mean, I could do honestly, this all day. I got a feeling a lot of the people listening to us have been in these positions themselves it's, as they're venturing out into the yeah, world over the last it's been incredible. weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but do you think we're heading back? I mean, like, the, apparently we've got so much vaccine that we're giving our extra supplies to Mexico and Canada now. Of course, there are some people who don't want to get vaccinated at all, don't trust the government. Uh, but yeah. for the most part, it feels like people are like, fuck yeah, stab me as quickly as possible uh, with this shit because I want to get back to normal. People are going to movie theaters uh, in L.A. They've opened the movie theaters in L.A. Not down here just yet, but in yeah. L.A. they have. So, I mean, it just Minimum feels capacity. like slowly. Yeah, it's like 25%. Yeah, but slowly it feels like we're starting to get back to normal. Does this, does this worry you or do you think we're okay? Do you think we can handle it? Who knows? <laughs> in, in honestly, in the long scheme of things, I have no idea. Yeah, my right. My problem or my fear is so everybody gets the vaccine, right? And mm -hmm. it comes out where there's two two new variants and there's nothing we can do about it. I don't think you're going to get this lockdown again. No, people are going to rebel like crazy. Once you've given them a taste of being outside the prison, 
they don't they're not going to want to go back inside the doors again. Yeah. yeah. It's you know, unless yeah. it turns into the plague, it's uh if you die, you die situation. Right. It's like, okay, all right. Uh yeah, that's where I'm I'm more concerned with that than tentatively getting back out and putting my toe back in the water. It's Yeah. I think the next go around is everybody's like, I don't care. I don't care this time. Yeah. Cause you know, people rebelled from early on and we're a year in at this point. It's true. So the, Wrestle, the WrestleMania situation is crazy. I don't know if you saw that, but WWE wants to do mm-hmm. a two night WrestleMania, 45,000 people each night in Raymond James stadium. And that just seems like so much, man. And they, any and kind Florida. of distance between them. Yeah, they'll probably, the, they'll probably have the probably have the six foot distance between them, but I mean forty five thousand people. How many? Do you think wrestling fans? And I know don't get offended anybody who's listening. I'm a wrestling fan too, but do you think wrestling fans are gonna maintain that distance and and not you know have their masks uh you know or have their masks in the pro- wearing them properly while they're yelling their face off? Fuck no, man! They're gonna be ripping them down, <laughs> screaming like crazy. I don't know. I th- I think you could get away with a good chunk of them doing it. You think you know being doing the right thing, you think. Yes. Okay. If it's still general protocol amongst places and they do it, yeah, I still think cuz you see it at basketball games, the sparse people that are spread out and that's yeah. indoors. They're but, spread out. Though, so that's Yeah, good. but everybody's yeah. wearing their mask. I mean, every once again you True. can see them like adjusting, but I who doesn't do that? Yeah, but 2000 is easy to manage. 45,000 is a whole nother situation. True, but it's also outdoors. Yeah, that's a good point too. And yeah, there's, yeah. it's by all indications that that I've seen the the worst places you can be is somewhere indoors, unventilated, because then you're just genuinely sharing the same air. Whereas outdoors, you reduce the risk, yeah, a tremendous amount. Still though, your ass, you know, it's forty five thousand people, yeah, so it's a lot. But outdoor, I mean, it's if they were doing this indoors and like a sixteen thousand, and they were going to do ten thousand, twelve thousand people, and we're like, we're not at capacity, be like, yeah. It's too many people in a small enough space. Yeah, that's why you don't have too many people showing up to like their NXT stuff, which is indoors inside yeah. of a 15,000 area or 12,000 area. Yeah. Yeah. And even as the wrestlers, I wouldn't feel. Whereas if I was a wrestler outdoors, no problem. Let's yeah, do it. Right. Can we figure out a venue with 60? I got zero problem with this because they're so far away from me. Yeah. Do you think uh, the NBA will end up doing that for the playoffs again? Like one place, all the playoffs, no. and what do you think it'll be all over the place? All right. uh, the players won't agree. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Nah, they hated it. Even the <laughs> teams that won, they hated it. I'm sure um, they did. I'm sure they did. I understand their complaints. And then somebody like uh, Dame Lillard is like, yeah, you know, we make millions of dollars. So the complaint is, you know, take it for what it is. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. But, yeah. I mean, so, I, I, but I respect it though, Matt. Don't you like this being around the same guys for like fucking three months? Oh no, it's great. I loved it as a fan. Of course, it was a fan. Yeah. super interesting. I would have been down there had they let me and had like had pass uh, media credentials and was covering it. I would have totally done that. Yeah. Um, because it's a gonna be a completely unique experience. Yeah. But the people that were there for you know the entire duration, like it's a routine. It's boring as shit. We're here nonstop. We don't get yeah. to see or do anything it's like yeah but no one else is really either yeah yeah true uh, very true yeah yours is just a little bit more extreme but mm-hmm. you're still getting paid like dame said so it's like the all-star game they didn't want to do it it's a risk yeah but if partners need it television partners advertising partners etc 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 how much of your salary do you want reduced to not play this game right right <sighs> Now you're affecting your teammates, and so you go play the game. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a trade off. It's a trade off. But at the same time, I think their their trade off is you know one they all made the same decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, only a couple guys opted out of the bubble. But yeah, I don't think yeah. they'll do it again. Though. They'll yeah. continue to travel between teams and hope nobody gets COVID. Yeah, we'll see what happens <laughs> with the NCAA tournament too. <laughs> That's going to be interesting. I, I don't know how they're doing that, but good luck to them. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, especially the women's tournament, which is in Texas, where that idiot Abbott was like, nobody can wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask anymore. Ride around free. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But, you know, whatever, man. Uh, I feel I feel. Well, yeah, but you don't dangerous. have to. You can still wear a mask. They're you not can, saying of it's course. illegal to wear a mask. Of course, so. of course. 
there is that. And there are businesses that are saying you still got to wear a mask that you come here. And I imagine the university would as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll see. Yeah. I heard the number ones that got released and I was like, wow, I don't follow college basketball anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's just the true genuine blue bloods are nowhere to be seen. I saw Kentucky ended their worst seasons in like 1963 or something ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Duke was not good. Yeah, Duke got the COVID situation. They were winning turn. They were winning games in the tournament, and then yeah. got the COVID stuff. And they're like, "Boom, we're done. The season's over. We're out. And that's it." And so, oh, really? I didn't yeah. hear that. Yeah, they shut it all down. They're the ones who pu they pulled themselves out of the tournament, and then they pulled themselves if they were in any remote contention for the NCAA tournament, which I don't think they were actually. They pulled. They pulled because they had so many losses. They pulled themselves out of that as well. So. Kind of a, I didn't break up with you. You broke up with me type of situation. Yeah. yeah or you, you didn't break up with me. I broke up with you type situation. But, you know, it works out for for some of the other teams. And you're right. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you've got the uh, Michigan up there dancing around. You got, but you got uh, new people like Gonzaga really being the top dog. Yeah. They're uh, 1A, aren't they? They're the yeah. number one overall. Yeah. Number one overall. Uh, so it's interesting. It's going to be fun. I mean, it starts, I think it starts tonight, the playing games. So uh, I'll see if I can uh, talk my girlfriend yeah. and let me watch but some of those games while we're watching. Michigan's like a, a blue blood in, it in is. theory. In theory. Yeah. They have had some high peaks, but it's nowhere near the Kentuckys. The oh, no, of course not. Of the world. Yeah. The Kansas, right. the North Carolinas. Yeah. The, yeah. Michigan State. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it starts at today at 2 p.m. PT, man. Yeah, four games today. Wow. Wow. Who's playing today? Texas Southern takes on Mount St. Mary's. Uh, Drake, Drake by himself, taking on Wichita State. <laughs> uh, Tim Appal and Four Owls. <laughs> it's just him and four. Uh, uh, are the and, Billikens uh, in it? St. Uh, Louis? Uh, St. Louis. I don't know if the Billikens are in it. Good question. Uh, Appalachian State takes on Norfolk State, and UCLA takes oh. on Michigan State. Talk about blue bloods. Two teams. Yeah, but, wow. Wow. But yeah, but UCLA's is from a bygone era. Michigan State's is still relevant. Yeah, because Tom Izzo is still there. Yeah. So they had a bad year, but you know. Yeah. I wonder if he still has that every four years he makes the final four streak. I'm guessing that's dead at this point, but he had that Probably. for a long time. Yeah. So if so long as you stayed at the program, you were making a final four at some point. The bodies are in. Say Bonaventure. Shout out to them. Okay. A team at the Grand... I don't even know this university. Grand Canyon University is in... Sure. I've never heard sure. of them. In my time. I have heard of them. I don't you know have? them for... I mean, okay. they may have made the tourney at some point, but I have heard of them. All right. Respect. Yeah, but yeah, that's... You know, that's not... You know, <laughs> those random teams. My question, what's Appalachia State ranked? Oh, Appalachian State. Uh, I don't think they made it, pal. I don't think. The oh, same. you said versus them versus Norfolk. The Billy. Oh, is that? Uh, oh, wait. Hold on. Was that the uh, earlier game? It's okay. Like hold second. On. Yeah. Let second me go back morning. to that one. Uh, Appalachian State is sixteenth. It's sixteenth. Norfolk okay. State sixteenth. So battle. Oh, it's the a playing game. It's yeah, a playing play game. All right. Game. Yeah. I was going to say because wow, both those teams are fourteen to sixteen seeds. Yeah. The, but, so, uh, there's two playing games today: Texas State versus Mount St. Mary's and Appalachian State versus Norfolk State, and then two regular games amongst two 11 seeds: Drake and Wichita State, and UCLA and Michigan State. So there you go. Woo! It's a lot, man. Colgate's wow. in this tournament. Colgate. Knowing what? nothing, I, I'm going to go with uh, Wichita, and Michigan. Okay. All right. I like what you're saying. I like Oral Roberts University is up in this thing. Yeah. He, there you go. Every like three looks, years, Oral Roberts makes it. Yep, healing people and hitting shots. Uh, Cleveland State is back in this thing. Good to see Cleveland. North Texas. North Texas, son. Uh, hmm. Yeah. And then Georgetown. You heard about Georgetown, right, Patrick Ewing? Winning the Big East tournament, getting into the tournament with a 13-12 and 12 record. There you go. I just heard about his kerfuffle at the Garden. Oh, my God. How funny was that, dude? So I mean, James Dolan, what a what a guy! What a what a guy! Uh, 
You see a tall black man wander around. You ask him his credentials. You ask him his credentials. It's fucking Patrick. You Patrick Ewing looks like no other human alive. Yeah, dude. I don't know. I don't know how you fucked that up. How do you ask for credentials of Patrick Ewing, man? Like Patrick could just point to a fucking picture and go, "That's yes. me, bitch." And that's yeah. almost every basketball you're, ever, player you'll ever see because they're yeah. obscenely big. Yeah. Even when they're six four, they're like pretty built yeah uh and you're like yeah that that dude doesn't look like anybody else i know what's up man um <laughs> whereas they were saying that wouldn't happen to jeter at yankee stadium be like yeah but jeter could look like a regular another dude. dude you'd meet yeah yeah patrick yeah. ewing looks like patrick ewing that's it that's all yeah. it's like yeah. the you know man do you hear the unfortunate news about sean bradley that's dude terrible. it's terrible oh, heartbreaking Feels so bad man. for him oh shit i mean as if the dude didn't endure so much shit for years from NBA players trying to get their names, trying to get their pictures on a poster, trying to posterize poor Sean. He's a, he goes and like does missionary work. He's very devoted to his family, to his religion. Good guy from what everyone says all around a block from his fucking house hit from behind uh, while he's riding his bike by a car and just paralyzed yeah. man. Fuck. Plus, he was already staring down having arthritis and probably yeah. having to have hip replacement and everything else because there's no human body's joints are meant to be that big. Good point, like the man. bones that long, just misalignment, any slight misalignment in that seven foot four, three, yeah. six. I don't even know, dude. The dude was tall. Yeah. 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 It's going to screw you up for life. Uh, and oh, just felt so bad. But yeah, be like Sean Bradley and be like, Sean Bradley looks like Sean Bradley. Yeah. Sean Bradley walked into, you know, Utah. They'd let Sean Bradley in and be like, that guy, I know that guy from somewhere. Uh, yeah, I know he's from somewhere. I, somewhere. Well, hold on. We're in a, we're in a, a basketball oh. arena. Do you think maybe he's tangentially a <laughs> basketball I, player of some kind? Possibly. You think? Huh. Patrick, <laughs> it's just utterly ridiculous. It's like Shaq. It's like, hi, ah, you're not. Shaq's a... They don't build people like that or big show. Uh, yep. The wrestler guy, if I can, I don't know what his real name is, but if he walked in and be like, that's only one human being that looks like that. That's true. That's true. So, you know, I don't get uh, how you mess that up, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know how you mess that up. Jason that's Momoa walks on set. You don't go. Who's the disturbingly handsome dude that's chiseled. He definitely doesn't <laughs> need to be here. You assume. That dude is, <laughs> you know, playing the same game you are. You just assume. So you see Patrick <laughs> Ewing, you go, it looks like he belongs here more than I do. That's Patrick. I'm, I'm going to step that's, aside. Yeah, that's Patrick. Oh, that's Patrick. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. I don't watch the game. All right. Well, there's my picture right there from the uh, 1994 playoffs. And that's my picture over there from. <laughs> and here's, yeah. That's actually a still of a game winner. Right there, you can see the buzzer going off and the ball's about to go in the hoop. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm Patrick. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh. <laughs> oh man, craziness. Yeah. Uh, so much uh, so much madness going on there. You know, just whatever. But anyway, enjoy March Madness. Yeah. You're going to watch it, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good time over the next few weeks. Uh, I might actually watch some games. Uh, Tomorrow, I've got some stuff to do, but I might have it on in the background because it's been a bit, and it's nice to be on top of it, do the game time show on Monday, so might as well be aware of it. Somebody responded really great just to put a button on this Patrick Ewing story. We were mm -hmm. doing game time on Monday because it broke over the weekend, that story, and uh, someone chimed in. One of the listeners or followers was like, um, the irony is that the security guard was John Starks asking Patrick <laughs> Ewing for his identity. <laughs> Why you got to, you know... You don't punch down. You don't punch down. You punch up. <laughs> that's that's not fair. That is not fair. Oh, I was on the ground. <laughs> that's a good. That's that's so mean for no fucking reason. Uh, oh, anyway, anyway, we convinced enough. Let's get into this list here. Uh, right. As Matt mentioned earlier, we're counting down the top 10 Forrest Whitaker movies. Because some random movie we might have stumbled upon in the coming soon section. <laughs> that apparently has gotten pushed. 
Yeah, uh, it got pushed. It's not That's on his point. IMDb, and somehow yeah. it wasn't, you know. It, I, we found it somehow. <laughs> and so we're doing Forrest Whitaker. And uh, if you're new to the show, go back and listen to the other shows, and I explain how the show works <laughs> roughly 350 <laughs> times at this point. Roughly. <laughs> Try 1,500. We've been doing it for four yeah. fucking years, dude. Four or five fucking years. No, no <laughs> idea. But there's other examples. So you go listen to those. So at 10, uh, at 10, I got burdened. What is that? On list? <laughs> yeah, let me see. I think that's a punt. Bert, yeah, it's a punt. It's a slight punt, okay. but it's a punt. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. <laughs> And <laughs> nine yes. was the movie that threw me for a loop fast uh, times when you brought it up earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's only in a it, small part, so he didn't make my list, but totally yeah. respect you bringing it up, brother. Yeah. Well, that introduced me as a kid to Forrest Whitaker, I think, by and large. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so crazy in that to, film. So hilarious. To know that he's been with me my entire life now at this point, it's why it made my list. Fast Times is not one of my favorite movies. I've got mm -hmm. friends that. Love it. It's one mm -hmm. of their all time, like top three to five movies. Yeah. Uh, I like parts of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, like the ticket scalper guy, I, he kills me every time. Oh my God. That, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. His friend. And then his friend that's kind of nerdy, like that whole storyline kills me every time. It's why are we spending so much of screen time with these two? Yeah. 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 I love Spicoli because he only is allowed to do very small things, but boy, I'd love a little more Spicoli in this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I judge Reinhold is an interesting character and maybe something else from Nick cage. I don't know. Brad, Brad. Yeah. Uh, but Forrest Whitaker is just, I mean, he's, I remember those kids in high school that in eighth grade, they were men, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. So Patrick Ewing. Patrick, Patrick Ewing, Ewing <laughs> was six foot four in, uh, in eighth grade. Absolutely. Uh yeah, but there was like a kid in my school that could grow almost a beard in eighth wow. grade. Wow. Really? Yeah. Shit. You're like, that's not natural. That's not natural. That's not, you know. He was a man, practically. <laughs> so now he's, you know, uh is he a senior in this? He is a senior. Is he, he is not? a senior. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're talking about you know potential college scholarships and stuff like that. But yeah, he just looks yeah. so much bigger than everybody else. Uh, yeah. And he's yeah part of. I wish I got more Forrest Whitaker too in this. Yeah. I just the scalper and his buddy. That's the whole storyline kills me on that movie. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so that is my nine. All right. Uh, what's your eight? My eight, surprisingly, phenomenon. Oh. <laughs> Just a slight punt. But Is we'll it really? Tonight. Just a slight. Okay. Just like really just a slight one. Sure. So, uh, my number 10 is Ghost Dog, uh, Way of the Samurai. Did you ever see that okay. one? I did not see that okay. one. Okay. Yeah, pretty cool, interesting film where he's like this assassin uh, who is, uh, you know, kind of qu questioning this final job he has to do. I think Jim Jarmusch directed it, and he's like on this like uh, existential journey throughout the movie. He's just like there's like voiceovers and conversations and narration and stuff like that where he's exploring who he is and mm -hmm. um and and apparently uh Forrest was a huge samurai guy so it that's kind of how he got cast in the situation from conversations with Jim Jarmusch and so he wanted to kind of do an American version not necessarily of a samurai but the samurai codes the samurai ethics in mm -hmm. in an in an assassin's or hitman's rather um approach to the world so pretty interesting film the only reason i don't move it higher because he is the lead of that film is it's it's kind of doesn't hold up now when you watch it and it still feels a little weird and there okay. are probably some of you who are listening or watching who are like oh shit that's higher up on my list or i've never even heard of that movie i would recommend you give it a chance or give it a rewatch um it's, it's a good movie it just doesn't it doesn't hold up as strongly as i would like and it doesn't have the catch factor for me that some of his other movies that i have on higher up on my list and do so okay yeah jim jarmusch though interesting film uh all right my number nine and I'm, i know people are gonna be mad that it's so low on this list is blood sport is that a punt oh son of a bitch <laughs> did you forget he was in that? well i did yeah, yeah I, I went through his rotten tomatoes i probably Ooh. should have gone through his imdb all right so that makes mine 
I okay. knew I was forgetting something. I was staring at this list going, where the I fuck. <laughs> uh do you, do you need a few seconds? Go ahead. Yeah, well, let's see. See, it becomes in. All right, so fast times is off. Okay. For sure. All right, so I'll bump burden down. I'll keep it 10. Okay. Let, let's see. Because in burden, I don't have the same misgivings about a huge chunk of the storyline. Yeah, so that's yeah. why it's it's maintaining. Mm -hmm. It's a small part. I think I'd put it in like the eight range. So yeah. Okay. All right. So nine, eight. I'll pop for it you. there. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it's he's not the lead of the movie, but he's a he's a fun part of the movie. We recently did a rewatch with uh, Lindley's family, and um, Lindley looked over and she's like, "What the fuck? Forrest Whitaker's in this movie?" I'm like, "Yeah. It's. I mean, this is." Back then, when you know black actors were you know wanted to work, they could take whatever job they could get. They grabbed it to work and pay How their bills. So dare you? Because the <laughs> movie I forgot to put on my list is a classic. Okay, it's such a classic. You forgot to put it on. All right, I know. Fair I enough. Did. Fair enough. I did. And uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I love Bloodsport. His part is tiny. It is. It is. It is. Uh, but it's essential to the film. I love how angry yeah. he gets. Um, and once again, this is the gift of Forrest Whitaker. He can play status all over the range, and you believe mm -hmm. him. Whether he's a bumbling guy, which he kind of is here as an as kind of the junior agent in the movie to the other guy who's the senior agent, FBI agent, whatever they are, uh, or you see him as a hard ass killer like in in, in Idi Amin, he can play it all up and down the scale, and it's believable. True. Sure. So it's that's what's so great about Forrest Whitaker's talent. Yeah, and as he is actor. as you brought up before he's needed in this movie yeah oh yeah because otherwise frank dukes has no motivation you know for a, a bunch of what he's doing yeah exactly exactly uh yeah great choice Badass. uh and then my number eight is uh black panther uh, all right that's uh my seven okay all right um yeah black panther uh i absolutely love the movie um as we've as i've said before here on the show uh, but uh, he is so, so you talk about essential. He's essential part of the movie as well as conversations with, um, with, uh, 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 oh my God, what's wrong with me? It's, it's conversations uh, with the black Panther, with the Chala uh, Chadwick Boseman. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, all of that uh, kind of colors the first part of the movie so that when what happens to him happens to him in the movie, it carries weight. It carries resonance. Yeah. Um, and it shows a, uh, combo of the guilt and the responsibility of the situation coming all together at once, multi mm -hmm. in a multi generational way, and I think that's powerful. And he is important to the movie uh, in that way. He does a great job in it as well. Um, and shout out to the kid who plays his son or plays his version of him, which I think is his son when he's young. Oh, in Oakland. So, yeah. yeah, in Oakland. So there's uh, a lot here that he does that I really enjoy. Yeah. But it's not a big enough part to move it higher up the list. But I put it here for sure. Yeah, I landed it there for that specific reason of it's such a good movie yeah. in terms of, you know, in the, the scope of Marvel, obviously, we just did, yes. you know, that show. It doesn't make mine because I was kind of bored with uh, origin stories at that point. I figured he was already established, so I went in with different expectations. Yeah, yeah. But you can't deny it's, you know, interesting to watch mm -hmm. uh, the cinematography. I mean, it's basically a... a Bond superhero film. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a tremendous amount to appreciate, but Whitaker's part within it is it a, it's a bridge to that spiritual world because otherwise yeah. he would like go down to it. If you have nobody giving the exposition of what's about to happen, uh, it seems strange. Yeah. It's like yeah. Tilda Swinton's you know discussion in Doctor Strange as to what that astral plane, what it all means. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have some sort of explanation. Otherwise, that's one of those. Even if you show me, I need something else. Right, I need because, to visually see it and experience it. Yeah, put in context. It's usually yeah the adage within "show me, don't tell me." But there are times it's just like I have to tell you on top of right, right. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it was key I think in that movie to really get the emotional impact later on because he's carrying the generations of, of people with him. So yeah, yeah. Whitaker was so key in that. I was like, ah, yeah. And then the movie overall is. The production value is through the roof. Yeah. Compared to something like Bloodsport or Phenomenon or Burden that made my list. Anyway, so there it is. That was okay. my seven. That was your eight? Yes, my eight. So what's okay. your six? My six is The Crying Game. 
Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, go ahead, man. Go ahead. I actually don't have Not that on, on list? my list. Not on my list. One of the his late part cuts. is small. Yeah. His part is small, but the movie is so unique and interesting. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. That I wish he had a larger part because I would have put it up even higher. You know, if, if he was say the lead in this, then, uh, we'd be vying for number one. Right. Right. Um, but because this part is so much smaller, it's like, ah, but that movie is so good. I don't know. It's a weird, I had trouble with this list uh, yeah. this week because he floats in and out. And sometimes it's to look at the amazing job that he did only in these small little bits, but that's exactly what you needed from that character. And he delivered it a plus. Yeah. He's rarely, uh, an, unessential part of the movie i don't know if he's ever been an unessential part of the movie because as you said in in blood sport he's the one that's agitating to get frank ducks it's the older agent that has to calm him down and be like you know let him fight the kumite and then we'll take him afterwards but he wants to take him out of the kumite right there so seriously so frank has a lot of pressure on him uh if mm -hmm. you look at black panther like you said he's the one that kind of introduces this whole story and the connection to the dad and all this stuff and the child they left behind he's the one that tells the story and here same situation in crying game although th the reason i dinged this because his accent is really not good so i don't put the his british accent whatever it's, not, it's just not good and so I ding him a little bit for that but he is the one that tells Stephen ray's character about jay davidson who plays the um, the uh, main uh, person in the movie that is the whole subject of the, of the twist, you know, um, yeah. because he speaks about how much he fell in love with her and was into her and, and all of that. And that inspires Steven as a kind of um, apology for having to do what he did to him uh, at the beginning of the movie to kind of make it all right, to kind of try to make yeah. amends. And so, so he's an essential part of that setting mm -hmm. up that whole storyline uh, and so as a director, you must be so grateful when you get Forrest Whitaker to say yes to play a smaller part in your movie because, Great point. you know, you give him that uh, weight to convey to the story. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good I, movie, I would though. assume I would assume you don't have to worry. You know what I mean? Right. Right. You right. get Forrest Whitaker and be like, whatever he chooses is pretty much money in the bank for that character. So, yeah, I know I'm going to get from him what I need. Mm -hmm. uh and then some so mm -hmm. and you never hear nothing negative you never hear anything negative about forrest you never hear people no. complain about working with them or that he's a diva anything like that just does his job man you got to respect that in this day and age um all right so that was your six correct okay so then my seven is bird which is a slight punt from earlier um i like Did that you say bird yeah bird isn't that what you said i said bird in Oh, what is burden? That's not even uh, on well, my it's list. Burden, B U R D E N. Oh, was, all right. I apologize. Uh, I misheard you. Please go ahead then. I don't oh, know what burden uh, is. So he plays a uh, minister in South Carolina, and Ooh. Garrett Headland is part of the KKK, and him and uh, uh, Tom Wilkinson. Mm hmm are opening a museum to the KKK. It's a true story. Mm -hmm. And they open it, and basically Forrest Whitaker is, is part of the people that stand up to him, you know, just protesting and whatnot. And it's the stories intertwining, but eventually Garrett Headland is a KKK member that renounces the KKK through the love of a woman, but they have to live with Forrest Whitaker for a time. Yeah. And he's the one that helps get them back on their feet, whereas Wilkinson is still pouring poison into his ear trying to tell yeah. him you know you're less than now that you've left and you've kind of disgraced your heritage uh but the it's a little uneven that's why you know it was lower it's interesting i didn't know the story existed but uh i don't know garrett headland at times is really good and other times it's a uh, he made very specific character choices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i appreciate though that he made a choice yeah. Um, but there's one characteristic he sways a lot, and I've seen guys that do that. Okay. Um, but he's you know, so it it sucks you in, at least it did for me in certain scenes, and it also okay. pulled me out in others. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know, it was hard because sometimes it seemed very authentic. I knew someone like that. Mm. Uh okay. Not like I'm saying like a racist from South Carolina. I'm saying someone that approached the world in much the same way, like they were right. kind of sheepish, but trying to figure themselves out. And they, 
did the same type of thing. It's a, you know, it was a choice. Yeah. I appreciate it. But anyway, so that's Bird. Okay. Bird, I have not seen. I thought about oh. it for this week, but okay. it's two hours and 41 minutes, I believe. Yeah. I looked it up. I was like, I don't have the time this week for a three-hour movie. So, <laughs> so I wish I did because it's one of those of, oh, yeah, Bird. Yeah. How have I not seen this? And, uh, you know, another week passes. It's, so one, of, <laughs> it's one of the early Clint Eastwood directed films um, uh, that he's still kind of finding his way. But you know Eastwood is, uh, if you know anything about Eastwood, you know he loves jazz, just a massive lover of jazz. And that comes through in this movie. And, of course, it's based on the life of Charlie Parker. Uh, mm -hmm. That was his nickname, Bird, for those of you who may not know. And this is Forrest Whitaker kind of breaking out, as we said earlier, from those smaller roles and getting a chance to lead a film. Uh, this is, I think, sure. 1988 or something like that. Let me see that sounds right. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, I'm working on movie release dates in my mind, uh, so trying to make sure. 88 or 89, but 88 sounds right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, 88. All right, all right. Uh, 1988, and it's him, and I think Diane Venoria. Diane Venora plays his wife, and there's an actor who plays Chet Baker, and so it explores all of this um, history of Charlie Parker, which is kind of a tragic history and an incredible history as well with what he was able to create, but also his substance abuse issues and there are some pretty dark moments in the film. And it's it was the film that, like, when you watch it, you you knew immediately that Forrest Whitaker was an actor to be reckoned with going forward if directors were going to give him the opportunity to show what he could do. Uh, and it was incredible to watch. And his yeah. size, his natural size and energy completely worked for playing Charlie Parker. And the jazz scenes are great. Um, but yeah, but it's one of those films that doesn't get talked about that much when they talk about Clint Eastwood's films. And I think mm -hmm. it deserves way more respect, uh, than it gets from a lot of people. So yeah, that's why I felt I should put it on my list. Yeah. I know I wanted to, I genuinely wanted to watch it because mm -hmm. I assumed it would make what's not to love Forrest Whitaker lead role. Yeah. Uh, I, I am a fan of jazz. We got Clint Eastwood's, so could... but it came out in 1988. I was nine years old. <laughs> right. Right. I have gone back for others. You do miss things, though. You know, you sure. can't watch them all. Right. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, so, I'd be a little worried if you'd seen it at eight years old. I'd be a little. I worried. wouldn't have enjoyed it. <laughs> I didn't start listening to jazz until I was nineteen. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's standard. I think it, I, you'd have to be some kind of fucking prodigy to understand jazz at a young age. You just would have to be because it's such a difficult art form to consume and understand and explore. And it asks so much of the listener when you're listening to it, you know, so um, it makes sense. Well, right. you're also raised on a completely different style. So you're yeah. used to hooks and certain time signatures and certain keys yeah. and lyrics and everything else. Uh, yeah. So it's, it ain't that. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. So that um, was your... Yeah, that was my seven. So then my okay. six is the punt from earlier phenomenon. Okay. Yeah. I love this movie, man. Absolutely love this movie. I remember I watching it. Yeah. I watched this movie at a time in my life when I was starting to consider what I was going to do. Like going back to school, go like to college. Uh, I was kind of nearing the end of my time in the service. Mm -hmm. And I went to see this movie by myself. I think I remember one of the theaters in Fairfax by myself, one of the outer theaters in Fairfax. And I just walked in and just fell in love with the movie from top to bottom. I think it's one of Travolta's greatest performances. Um, and it completely changed my, my point of view on the world. It was kind of impressionable at that time about how I wanted to handle the world. And it just really affected me. And Forrest Whitaker is such an, again, an essential part of this movie. Yes, is he the main character's best friend, but he's so much more than that. Uh, and their chemistry is so genuine, so touching as friends. They give him, you know, he's not just the best friend. He has his own inner life that he's working on, his own role as a ham radio operator. He's yeah. got an obsession with Diana Ross. Um, so he's got his own life. And those are scenes that are by himself. There are scenes by himself where he's not dealing with Travolta. So there's enough being built into his character that you enjoy him as a separate thing. And also his connection with Travolta and the occasional scenes he has with Kira Sedgwick, who's also great in the movie. Uh, but yeah, he's so genuinely yeah. touching, you know? I know. I, I like that was part of that 
Travolta resurgence, that Michael, which I right. don't mind actually. Yeah. At least last I saw it. Uh, it's been a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, Forrest Whitaker also helps to kind of give a little bit of levity when yes. the one dude comes over and he asks him to spin the toupee as like a joke, but yeah. it humanizes the ability that he has. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be this nefarious. It doesn't have to go chronicle, which I'm not saying this movie was. Right, but right a more lighthearted approach to having that type of power. It was, yeah, it's an, a unique movie. Yeah, it really is. I've never yeah. seen anything like it. Uh, nope. And not that I can think of. Yeah. And, a, and the approach to it, which is a very genuine, honest, warm approach to it. Um, and some people have tried to say, Oh, it's their kind of subtle way of doing Scientology. I'm like, well, if it is, it fucking worked for me and it didn't convert me into a Scientologist. It just made me yeah. feel happy about the human condition and the possibilities of what can happen if a human being just cares about people and has the ability to kind of step forward even more to do so. But it is, now I haven't read this since seventh grade or something, mm -hmm. but if memory serves, it's like a modified flowers for Algernon. Right. Right. Oh, good. Where point. he yeah. gets the special ability, but then burns himself out. So, mm -hmm. uh, the shooting star type yeah. of, you know, storytelling, but I haven't seen one like that where he's almost touched by God mm. and then burns himself out. But all the little science experiments he's got going and he's trying to figure out all the world's problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's, it's yeah. you know, Travolta's made some clunkers in the interim, but I'm glad he does continue to work. I like Travolta. I like him too, man. He's got a great energy. He does. I, one of my favorite moments of uh, of my life was uh, meeting him at the Critics' Choice Awards a few years ago, getting mm -hmm. to shake his hand and telling him how much I loved Phenomena. That's the first thing I said to him, you know. And he was just like, he was very kind and warm about it. So, uh, it just you can sense the energy off of him is a really good energy, man. So, um, all right. Where it's, uh, let's go to your five, man. What's your so five? That was your six. Yeah. Uh, my five is Southpaw. Oh, uh, punt. That's a punt for me. Okay. I struggled. Okay. With where yeah. to place it. I can Bef right before we started, it was number three. Oh, and I, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's as high as it made it, but it was number three right before. And then I edited, uh, anyway. So okay. that's what's your five. Uh, good morning, Vietnam. That, is that, a that is a punt. Okay. All right. What's your four, bud? Uh, four is Rogue One. Oh, I didn't even put it on here. All right. Go ahead, my man. Really? Yeah, just... Uh, he's memorable. Look, it's just... Uh, you know, but the part itself, like how he... The voice and everything, I don't know. But, dude, I'm not going to criticize it. Go ahead, my man. Okay. I know what you're saying. <laughs> yes, okay. 100%. If yeah. you took him out of the movie, by and large, the movie does not stumble. Yeah, true, true. But I also think he had a larger part that they reshot because it wasn't working on that first cut. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, right, good point. The, yeah, stuff from the trailer that we didn't see. Uh, whatever the original ending was going to be, I'm guessing he had a much larger part in it. Right. Uh, and, you know, to both our tastes, they made, I guess, a good decision having I, never seen the other one. Right, right. Uh but the movie succeeds so well and he doesn't pull it down to mm -hmm. me. I don't mind the voice. I just feel okay. like he is underutilized, but I take into account the fact that this was a different movie, you know, than was originally conceived. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, my logic on this is not bulletproof. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I struggle. That's why I had South Paul above, you know, and I could do that right now. Actually, Never mind. They flip flopped between four and five, so okay. I'll, I'll flop those around. South Paul is my four. I can do Rogue One and five. All right, all right. I just all talked right. myself out of my four. That's fine. <laughs> all right, so that's my five and four. All right. Uh, we've talked about Rogue uh, One. Uh, yeah, we have. We have. We've talked about it a number of times. Uh, so yeah. then my four is uh, Panic Room. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Not okay. All right. Yeah, I like this movie. Such a. a, a um, again, one of these films that's kind of forgotten in a director's resume. People forget that Fincher directed this movie. Uh, the um, Forrest Whitaker is there with Jared Leto and Dwight Yoakam, 
Uh, mm -hmm. These are the three guys who are attacking Jodie Foster and her daughter, who is a young Kristen Stewart. Um, they are in, yeah. you know, they're in the, they, they have a panic room and these guys raid the house trying to get uh, to something that they need. Uh, and Jody has to fight them off through the panic room, her and Kristen Stewart. And it's an awesome film full of tension. And Forrest Whitaker is a character who just wants to get the job done, but he's got these two yahoos that he's working with that yeah. don't understand that they're fucking shit up more every time they try to indulge their anger or their evil side or their maniacal sides. And uh, they're getting outsmarted by Jodie Foster's character. And eventually Forrest gets caught up in that too, out of frustration himself of the situation. So he's, he's this guy who is, mm -hmm. he's, he's yes, he's a criminal, but he's not looking to hurt anybody because he's working some shit out. He's a criminal because he, if he gets to what he gets to, he's going to get paid and move on with his life and do the next thing, yeah. job. So he's a, he's in a professional criminal. And I like the uh, attitude he brings to the movie. And I think he's such an essential, again, essential part of the movie as, in essence, the leader of the bad guys uh, and his toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jody throughout is uh, just a really well done high wire of tension the whole time. True. Yeah. True. I just don't go back to rewatch it. That's why I didn't make my list. Oh, that's I think fair. My favorite in the movie is Dwight Yoakam. Yeah, Yoakam is a nut in that movie, man. He's so good. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, it's, I just read this the other day. Nicole Kidman was originally cast, and I wow. think they shot some with her, and then she tweaked her knee bad enough to where she was going to have to be off of her feet for six weeks or two months. Oh, wow, wow. Because she had hurt the knee previously doing Moulin Rouge the year before. Mm. It was like re-aggravating the same injury, right. and she was out. So they brought in Jodie Foster, who was pregnant at the time. Holy shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. So neither did I. They read all this. I was like, oh. what the fuck? So there's a bunch of shots where she's later on, like it, mm -hmm. when they get in closer to completion of shooting, and she's showing more and more, yeah. where she's obstructed, like it's a sitcom or a TV drama or something. <laughs> yeah, like a bowl of fruit or something. Yeah. Yeah, just, but it's, <laughs> you're not thinking in that mode. Yeah, right. And right. To know the kid one was on, I believe they shot a little bit with her, and then, or they were a few days into production type of thing, and then they brought That's in Jodie Foster for a few days outside of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I just don't go back to rewatch it. I know it's a good movie. I right. just, maybe I'll watch that one before I watch eh, possibly Burden again, but I think everything else on my list, I would happily watch over that one. That could be a fun top 10 what ifs down the road if we want to do that. Because like Annette Benning was going to be Catwoman until she had a horse riding accident mm. and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer was cast and to replace her. Uh, Doug Ray Scott uh, held up on Mission yeah. Impossible 2, mm -hmm. bringing in mm -hmm. uh, Hugh Jackman. So it could be fun down the road to count that down. I'm sure there are a lot of what ifs. You know? Eric Stoltz in Back to the Future. Harvey Keitel in Apocalypse Now. So fascinating. See that the Stoltz, I don't think in a million years would work, but the Kaitel, I could see. Yeah, right. You could see him doing nothing. nothing. Yeah, I could see. That's not so anomalous. There are other ones. Doug Ray Scott as Wolverine. There's no way Wolverine lasts this long. I think you're right. There's as, none. It's as a, good of an actor as Doug Ray may be, he doesn't have that thing that Jackman has. I think you're absolutely right. He doesn't have the charm Jackman yeah. has. Right. Right. It's like the, the best was, uh, or not the best, but have you ever seen that clip of he's on a red carpet somewhere and the reporter asks him a question and he, you can see a little glint spark in his eyes and he answers with, so apparently he was a PE teacher when he first started out like acting. Wow. And the, the reporter on the red carpet was a former student of his. <laughs> so cool. he goes like half a sentence into like four or five words into a sentence realizes it's him continues on and then turns it back on him and be like, yes, but my life would be much better if certain students <laughs> would have done X, Y, or Z. And they both start laughing. And then he's like, I taught this kid, the reporter pull around. He pulls him around in front of the camera. I taught, but wow. the guy's like, you know, shows it shows Jackman's age. The guy's, I would assume in the clip 30. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 32, something like that. You know, how funny, man. Yeah. But in that moment, pure charm. Remembered yeah. him, was nice, was genuinely nice about it. They were both excited to see each other, and it was it seemed right. honest. And you're like, that, that's what he's got. Yeah, yeah. That's hard to quantify. It's like Ryan Reynolds. That dude's got yeah. charm for days. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
you know, he's a big, uh, we're a big fan of Ryan Reynolds on this show. Um, which is right, general, like live, live tweeting is Green Lantern. Oh, yeah. Uh, and taking shots, but really respectful and nice towards the cast and the crew. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it seemed pretty good. Hopefully nobody got, you know, that worked on it was upset by that. I think it was done in good fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, um, where are we at now? My three, I believe. Okay. Have we done your four? My four. Yeah, we just did Panic Room. So we're, I think we're up to your three, like you said. Uh, three is Arrival. Uh, yes, that's my three. Absolutely. Um, just a excellent movie. He is great in it. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of, you know, it's a one in Adams and like a one B-ish two in Jeremy Renner. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? As far as the pecking order on, on screen time and all that, yeah. Forrest is easily third. Uh, but it helps to create the dynamic between on the push and pull of regulations and all that jazz versus Absolutely. doing what you think or know is right. Mm -hmm. um, and just a fascinating movie. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what else to say about uh, Denny at this point. I'm yeah. stoked for Dune. I think that trailer looks great. Yeah, we'll see if they. Well, it seems like you know if this if these vaccines go off the way they hope, it looks like he's going to get his wish to drop this thing in the theater, and uh, a range yeah. away from the drop it in the theater. We shall see. Yeah, just don't Chris Nolan this. Yeah, don't rush it. Yeah, just hold on. I know that you wanted to be the savior of cinema, Chris. <laughs> see that picture he took of himself in the Burbank theater? I was like, oh, you. No, I did not. <sighs> Wearing a mask, sitting in the theater, and I was like, "Man, you tried to kill half the world with your movie, man." Um, well, that's excessive. Maybe you tried maybe. to kill half the world. I mean, so, you know. I yeah, I just <laughs> I don't know. Could have delayed the movie. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, You'd have to your eye, yeah, your eyes got bigger than your what is that phrase? Yeah, your yeah, yeah, you're bigger than, than your mouth, something yeah. like that. You could or chew. maybe your eyes got bigger than your appetite. Yeah, that's it. Your eyes are bigger than your appetite. Because um, it didn't get nominated for Best Picture or Best Actor or anything like that. So, Kind of surprising. Nothing, all that for nothing, really. Yeah, kind of surprising <laughs> that it didn't get nominated. I'm not saying it's an Oscar-winning film or whatnot, right. but just prestige. It's Chris Nolan. It was a weird year. Yeah. To say the least. What's he up against? Who like find me the other one in this category that has this and it doesn't right. exist. Um yeah. But anyway, so uh arrival is our three. Yeah, arrivals. I, I love it. He's the western the uh, sorry, the military character he plays is the one that gets Jody Foster. Oh, sorry, Jesus Christ. Uh the one who gets Amy Adams. Amy Adams. They have the conversation, they get into what they, they present it, and so he is constantly around as the military presence throughout the movie. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's an, he's once again an essential part of it, and he's the one that has to have Amy Adams prove herself to him so she can take this job on. So, there's throughout the whole movie, there's this pressure on her to make sure that she is the right choice. Uh, and then, of course, you discover her story, and the overall movie itself is just fucking phenomenal, man. It should have won best yeah, picture that year, in my opinion. Yeah, it's beautiful mm -hmm. and wrapped up in a simple story about love and life. Mm -hmm. and protecting and you know knowing the future do you make the same decisions yeah i would argue that he out nolan nolan by making a movie about messing with time <sighs> what is you know what is like you know what, yeah. I'm saying? what is like yeah. the right thing to do if you know the outcome blah 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 so i think yeah nolan nolan man hey, that's yeah that's a philosophical question of you in the midst of this incredible spectacle of an a sci fi film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the simplicity of just these pod things floating there, right? Just gorgeous. Right. That's all you need. I don't need to see guns. Because the fact that that thing traveled from somewhere else blows my mind more than I assume it's got a gun. Yeah, right. So there is no point you, you pull out enough to win. You've already won. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't. Uh, you don't need to go yeah. full Milton Berle, you know? <laughs> so. Nice reference. 
Um, all right. So what's your number two, man? Uh, my deuce is good morning. Oh, okay. Go ahead. It helps cement how much I already liked Forrest Whitaker. This I did see roughly around when it came out. Okay. Um, yeah. Love Robin Williams so much. And he's part of the fun guys that want to have fun with Robin Williams and totally get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bruno Kirby, you are not funny. <laughs> it's pay dude. That I mean, that is some stellar acting yeah. to be that bad, and yeah. it's consistently bad in the same exact ways. So, there's a time and effort went into crafting this shit, mm -hmm. and just the the polarity of all of them. I've always loved that movie. Uh, yeah. Just part of a bunch of movies that uh, cemented my love of. Uh, Robin Williams. So mm -hmm. the fact that Forrest is one of the good guys, so to speak, in this. Yeah. And I've been watching that movie religiously ever since I was a kid. I knew it was going to make my list. It was just a question of top three where, but it beats Arrival because I've seen it so many more times. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So yeah. that is my deuce. Where'd you have it? And it still holds up. Yeah, it's a it's my number five. It's my number okay. five. It's still one of Robin Williams's greatest performances. It is a yeah. timeless comedy classic because it's yes, it's Vietnam, but the theater of war, the need to laugh, um, stuffy bureaucratic people who think they know better than you do, um, uh, the difference between pencil pushers and creatives. All of it is here throughout. And you're right, uh, Forrest Whitaker is so essential to this movie because. He's the guy that is allowing Robin Williams to be himself. If there's any mm -hmm. place that Robin Williams' character, Adrian Cronauer, can be himself, it is with uh, Forrest Whitaker's character, with Garlic. I think his name's Garlic, and how they uh, converse and talk about the situation and how he kind of breaks the tension that they've all been under, uh, under, under Bruno Kirby's essential rule of the yeah. place that they work at. And you're right. Bruno deserves uh, the late great Bruno Kirby deserves so much love and appreciation for playing a character that is uh, funny because he's not funny when he's trying to be funny. And that you're right. That is a very, very difficult thing to do. Oh, and he nails it. Nails so it. hard. Yeah. To pull off good, bad comedy is very difficult. Yeah. And to be more of a villain than the Viet Cong. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. Right. Right. The movie is just Deceptively uh, uh, explores the other side of the point of view yeah. of the people in Vietnam. That's a great point, Matt. Yeah, it's asking you to say, put yourselves in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Both sides did wrong. Mm -hmm. We're not condoning the violence of either side, saying there was you know might equals right or some shit like that. Right. So you have to look at it from the perspective and understand the motivations from from ours and theirs. And yeah, yeah so he was the only one where it was pure dick. As opposed to living in some sort of gray, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really impressive. But Whitaker is he's like his assistant, lieutenant, and manager all at the yeah. same time. Mm -hmm. Goes around with them, like introduces them around, yeah. ferries them around town, and all that. And then Williams eventually goes off onto his own, but he liaises. I love the the colonel that has to put Kirby in his place and be like, "Son, yeah. I don't give a good goddamn what they like," type of thing. Just cut through the mustard. Yeah, He's good. right. Like, they look, they like it. Yeah. They're on the front lines. That's what they get. And the soldier's morale is more important than yes, your, than your, belief. Yeah. Than your ego. Yeah. Trust me, yeah. sir. In my heart of hearts, I know I'm funny. I don't <laughs> care. I do not care. That is not what well, I'm here. I'm here to fight a war. Uh, it's great. I mean, yeah. over and over and over again, I would thoroughly enjoy that movie. And Forrest is just forced. So, is, that, is that Barry Levinson who directed that one? I always forget it. Great question. I do not know off the top of my head. Yeah, that could come up for you. Yeah, probably. Yeah, Barry Levinson. Cool. Nice pull. Uh, thank yeah. Um, yeah, that and that and yeah. I mean, what's more to say? Yeah, right. Everything you point out, Maz, you're absolutely correct about that movie. Just great, kind of subtle exploration of the other side of things. Um, and how we would feel. And also he changes them. Like when he leaves, garlic is a different person. For mm -hmm. having known uh, Adrian Cronauer and his portrayal changes as he goes along, which is great work by Forrest Whitaker. The subtle change in garlic, he becomes more, um, how can I say this? More opinion, he becomes more vocal about his opinions. He's able to push back a little bit. 
Uh, and in the yeah. end, he takes over for Adrian Cronauer. It isn't Bruno Kirby and his Frenchy imitation coming in and taking over. It is actually uh, Garlic who steps in to try to carry on the legacy as the DJ there. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So then my number two <clears throat> is a punt from earlier as well. Southpaw. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think now yeah. flip flop or I think I make that my four now. I, yeah. Okay. Cause I dumped row one down. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I love this movie, dude. And, uh, yes. Are there issues with the final act? Sure. If you want to have issues, I totally get it, but that doesn't take away from Forrest Whitaker's performance. Uh, he is stellar. He's powerful. Um, it's a great boxing trainer role to play. Um, yeah, it's and, it's tremendous. Yeah, exactly. It's what you've enjoyed from Mickey. He in the Rocky series, he takes it into a real place here, and his relationship with um, Jake Gyllenhaal is incredible. Look, mm -hmm. dude, if you're going toe to toe with with intensity 109, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, you got to be able to play in that sandbox and stand out yourself. And mm -hmm. he, he knows exactly when to come in lower than Jake and when to come in higher than Jake. And it's fucking great. Just fucking great. What's your problem with the third act? Well, I think some people complain that there's that he's like they, 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 the, the, the guy like who had killed this in essence was a uh, part of killing his but wife. They never resolved that. Yeah. They never resolved that. A lot of people have yeah. issues with that. I call that first act problems because they had several first act problems. Mm, That's why it okay. was down lower. Okay. Um, for me, at least, like just that you didn't need to have the guy shoot his wife. Right. But also then you didn't need to introduce the idea of a police investigation that goes nowhere. It goes and you nowhere. didn't need to. Yeah, yeah it goes okay, nowhere. They never right. bring it up again. It's never first discussed. Yeah, great point. Yeah, there. there's maybe a, there's first step issues. Yeah. So it's like, dude, if you subtract those, because once it gets into a story of him and his daughter and redemption and Forrest Whitaker trying to drag him out of the muck and realize that he has value and yeah. you can get your daughter back and you can be a fucking man. Yep. At that point, that movie is wildly successful. Yes. And yes. all, th all the three of those individuals are acting so superbly. The little girl with Gyllenhaal and then Gyllenhaal with Whitaker. Mm -hmm. It sings. I think that is, but for me, it's that first act. It's got two, three things that are just, Fucking lop those off because you don't need them. Yeah. His wife could just die and he falls into that drunken stupor. And then, you know, the the promoter that fucks him over and all that, it got to be like way too much after a while and be like, really? He had no liquidity. He's spending all of it. His yeah, wife was supposed to be on top of the finances, but she yeah. just died. So like six weeks later, he's destitute. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Especially not if she had a, a credo with the daughter of, if I ever go, you have to take care of daddy. Right, well, that means right. that she's thinking the long term. So there's no, yeah. So first act problems for me. Okay, that's fair. I think you're absolutely right. Actually, I changed my mind on that. So that's fair. Yeah, totally. But his performance is stellar. Just fucking stellar. Oh, he's great. Yeah, yeah. It's the perfect, um, you know, a lot of times movies rightly get, you know, Legend of Bagger Vance style ding mm -hmm. for having the black savior character. Right, the magical Negro. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this one to me isn't a magical, it's a, boxing there's you know there's white guys and there's black guys and there's latino guys and this is something you could put anybody into yeah well and uh, the two scenes are the scenes at the bar where after you know where he's like kind of raging and he talks to him about where he's at emotionally and then the scene later on where it's forrest whitaker who's lost that young kid he's been mentoring to gang violence and it's a uh, um, jake who has to talk to him in the gym it's fantastic. Those are the two scenes. I mean, every other scene is good, but those two scenes are the ones that really stand out for me uh, and why he's at near the top of the list uh, on my okay. list, at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great role. Yep. All right. So I guess our number ones are the same. Yeah. Last King of Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, brother. It's what the biggest, meatiest part that he knocked completely out of the park. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I, look, Idi Amin existed as some a name Dan Rather said. Yeah, right at night. Yeah, I yeah. Ted Koppel says Idi Amin. It it's you know mm -hmm. that doesn't come out of my mouth, but I've heard the name. I knew that he was in a 
part of the world that we weren't really have thrilled with what he was doing, you know, as a kid, yeah. as it was going on. So I had no real full connection to someone like Edie. I mean, uh, but I had a general understanding and to see him bring it to life and then to go back and then watch clips of Edie. I mean, it's really impressive. I love James McAvoy on the come up where you think James McAvoy is going to be in a bunch of prestige films over the next oh, five yeah. years. Yeah. But I'm not sure what happened there. Um, uh, X-Men derailed him i think still did well enough and then you got like split yeah split, split did well enough it was great in split yeah. perhaps it was the wanted and uh mm. there's like another one or two around that time that were supposed to be big and weren't yeah yeah uh, i'm not sure um but i know just to humanize someone like that mm -hmm. he did a tremendous job because you still you can see why they got to where they are through the worst of reasons. And also like the guy can't have charm, watch him charm McAvoy and think that they're friends. And then ultimately the guy that is ruthless and bloodthirsty comes out and be like that yeah. charms help facilitate him in other ways. He's a good politician. Yeah. There's no way you get to that level. Just being a military man, you yeah. got to play the politics as well. Uh, but the, the shift, he just shifts and just like, nah, this son of a bitch is cold blooded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I hope Forrest gets more of these. You know, uh, Lee Daniels, with the butler, was never going to make my list. Neither mine. Yeah. It's a TV movie. Yeah. Glorified TV movie. It like is. Blind. If there's, yeah, a TV movie's going to make it, then I'm going to put on the, uh, the goat, uh, the rebound, the story of. Oh, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Because I remember when that came out on HBO, because Kareem said the goat was the best player he ever saw. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. And Forrest <laughs> Whitaker plays Rucker. And I was yeah. like, I that's that to me is you got a better shot as a TV movie than Lee Daniels the butler. Yeah. Um hmm. but he's yeah. he's been, been in so many other good movies that I didn't want to put it on. But uh when you look at this one, for me it is oh. the everything he's done led up to this role. Mm -hmm. Um and you you say it so well, Matt. You know, uh, it's the meatiest one he's ever been given, and in our opinion, and he delivers it mm -hmm. in great way. But it is also every single tool he has an actor comes to the forefront throughout this movie. His size, his look, his charm, his ability to go crazy at the drop of a hat, uh, go cold. Um, his ability, well, actually, in this one, his ability with his accent is does a really great African accent. Yeah. All of it comes to bear here. Um, and he is strangely mesmerizing throughout the movie because he is seems like he genuinely wants to be friends with McAvoy, all this. And then that scene where he walks in and sees what Idi Amin has done to this woman who's had an affair on him with, I think with yeah. McAvoy, it is beyond chilling, beyond chilling. And you're yeah. saying this is it's Scarface. Such, yeah. But it's such a casual evil that well, it, it unsettles you. Like you're like, Oh my God, he has total authority, uh, power and autonomy to do whatever he wants to do by and, and large. Exactly. And his human beings to him are there is no morality here about oh. killing them. And he's not they're caught cattle. up. Yeah, they're cattle. He's not caught up in the good or the bad. He just mm. does what he does. And yeah, and he conveys it so well uh, up until that last moment, you know, in the movie. And um, it's, a, I think, the powerhouse of a film because of his performance in McAvoy, Jillian Anderson as well, and Kerry Washington. Just great stuff all around. Um, and that last scene in the airport, oh, my God, it's a fantastic scene. Holy shit. Um, Even though, like, how good it is that fart scene where he's <laughs> so backed up? Because that's legitimate. That can happen. You could die from that. Yeah, yeah. But I giggled in the theater, and I normally don't like fart jokes because I think that they're just easy once you get yeah. above a certain age. And that one was just honest. Yeah. Uh, I know somebody that had to go to the emergency room for what? that. What, really? Wow. Yeah. Because uh, you're going to pop. <laughs> If you honestly cannot pass the gas, like it's not good for you. Yeah, true, true. Uh, so uh, 
Yeah, just to see that, and he has to take that bat, that cricket bat or whatever it is, and hold, pull it in, you know, tight on him. But yeah. I laughed in the theater because it was a nice moment of catharsis in the middle of what I knew was going to be an ultimately very dark movie. Yeah, uh, in human eyes, you have to see the devil for the devil. You can't just make him out to be some mythical figure. Right. Right. So, still, person, just like all of us, he's just the shittiest of us. And you can't just and you can't have Billy Zane type approach to it. You have to give him yeah. level. Poorly, yeah, exactly. The, the mustache. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, all right. Well, there's our uh, separate lists of Forrest Whitaker. Let's put this uh, thing together, Matt. Give it our official list. Got the bongos here. All right. What do we got? I think it shakes out like this. Last King, uh, Southpaw, Good Morning, and Rival. Okay. So that's one through four. Okay. I've got my five. We have what? Crying game and possible. We have no, Black I Panther. Don't, I don't have crying game on mine, but we have yeah. Phenomenon and we have Bloodsport, right? Yeah. Bloodsport is now eight for me. Phenomenon is nine. Okay. I have Phenomenon six. So, so should we hit the, um, who's ever got the highest one left? So that's my five. What do you got? I have, um, Panic Room at four. Uh, okay, Panic Room. And then your five? Uh, yeah, we'll do my five. Okay. And then we'll do uh, Phenomenon. Okay. Each have Black Panther. I've got it at seven. You have it where? Eight. We have Bloodsport. Yeah. All right, so... And yet Bloodsport where? I'm sorry? Nine. Bloodsport was nine for me. All right. So Black Panther, Bloodsport. We got one left. Um, okay. The, my six. Uh, all right. Take your six because that's uh, I think that's all mine that are on there. So. Uh, all right. There we go. Done. Awesome. All right. Let's do this thing. The top 10 Forrester. Uh, the top 10 Forrest Whitaker movies. Yeah. At number 10. The Crying Game. At number nine, Bloodsport. At number eight, Black Panther. At number seven, Phenomenon. At number six, Rogue One. At number five, Panic Room. At number four, Arrival. At number three, Good Morning Vietnam. At number two, Southpaw. And our number one Forrest Whitaker movie is? Is The Last King of Scotland. Yeah, good stuff, man. Good stuff. I almost want to put that on again. It's such a chilling performance. He's so great at it. Yeah, it's been a minute since I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. We've talked about some of the best movies from one of the greatest actors working today. Of course, there's a bunch of other movies that maybe some of you enjoyed. Certainly, his TV work is excellent. As Matt mentioned, um, uh, the TV movie from HBO, the basketball movie. Also, Godfather of Harlem is apparently a fantastic series, I think, on Stars. It's that, good. Uh, that people. Oh, yeah, you watched it? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. So you recommend it? He's really good in it. Okay. Um the overall yeah, story. Yeah, it's got a like, lot of what I like. I like I like D'Onofrio's character, and then there's oh, I didn't know it was in it. Okay. Uh, there's a Malcolm Malcolm X is on it, and he's good. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's got it's got a bunch of good. I, I'm curious to see where it lands ultimately. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, that's it. All right, there you go. Well, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Top Ten. Uh, if you'd like to join our Patreon, hey. We would love your support. Uh, if you're watching us right now, it's right above my head, patreon.com slash the top 10. Uh, it's probably in the description of this video as well. Uh, and if you're uh, uh, listening to us, it's patreon.com slash the top 10, the number 10 there. Go and take a look. Uh, we also have our uh, YouTube channel. Just type in our names and the top 10, and it'll pop up there as well. Uh, what else do we have to tell them, Matt? Um, well, yeah, our uh, let's see. Twitter's at top 10 show. Um, YouTube and Instagram are the top 10 podcast with the number 10. Mm. And you can follow me anywhere at Matt Nost and check out uh, Dropping Dimes and Settle the Score. And that is it for me this week. There you, go. you can follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And of course, please come on over to my YouTube channel. We're about to drop 
uh, uh, some, oh, but we dropped actually by the time you hear this Falcon and Winter Soldier episode one review with Mike Kalinowski. And we dropped our live at Justice League, uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League review with Kalinowski as well, as well, uh, uh, this past weekend. So come and get involved there. YouTube.com slash John Roca says, all right, we're out of here. Much love to everybody. Take care of yourselves. Be well. And we'll talk to you next time on another brand new episode of the Top 10 Show.